Hello, everybody. This is the Cincinnati Herald podcast. I'm your host, John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. If you don't know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the largest African American newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area. And today I'm joined by my guest, co host, and media consultant of the Cincinnati Herald, Andrea Carter. How are you doing today, Andrea? Fine, John. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm also joined by Circulation Director of the Cincinnati Herald, Wade Lacey Sr. How are you doing today, Wade? I'm doing fine. It's good to be here. Good to hear. And we also have our Herald intern, Suhana Sinhan. How are you doing today, Suhana? I'm doing fantastic, John. Great to be back. All right. Good to have you back. Okay, so let's head into some of the top news topics of the week, starting with our first topic. 20-year-old Dante Wright was shot by Brooklyn Center Police Sunday afternoon after a traffic stop. Wright was shot by Brooklyn Center Police Officer Kim Potter, a 26-year police veteran. On Tuesday, Potter had submitted her letter of resignation from the Brooklyn Center Police Department and according to Police Chief Tim Gannon, who also submitted his resignation on Tuesday, said the shooting was accidental and that Potter had intended to deploy her taser, but instead shot Wright. Now ex-officer Potter is charged with second degree manslaughter. The charge carries a maximum penalty of 10 years behind bars. Andrea, what's your take on this um, horrific story? Well, I, I think it's horrible. I think it's just astonishing that we have another death result of a traffic stop. And um, I know they played up the fact that Dante Wright had a warrant and some other things. The The fact that, it, again, it ended with a death is just unbelievable. From what I understand, there the BMV in Minnesota had been closed for a while. So there are a lot of people who have expired license plates. And it was urged by the state officials that police officers take care of knowing that a lot of people have expired plates right now because of the BMV. So I think things could have been handled differently. Um, I think um, the police officer showed poor judgment on what she did. And also, you know, you have to speculate how the events unfolded. It's amazing to watch how all of this has just come about. Yes, definitely. Wade, your thoughts on this story? Well, on one of our previous podcasts, we had spoke about something similar to this. And uh, my response was that uh, things hadn't changed. And again, we are reminded that things haven't changed. So easy to kill a Black man and then claim accidental. I did not see the shooting. I'm sure maybe some of you have, but I did not see the shooting. Uh, and they say she is saying that she thought she was firing a taser. So I don't know if he was shot once, twice or more or, or, or what the case may be. But if it was more than one sh- uh, shot, uh, there's no way she can say she thought it was a taser. Because once you hear the first gunshot, you know he's, he's shot. Uh, the, the gun has gone off. It's, it's disappointing as always. It's, it's, it's uh, scary, but uh, like I said before, it's 2021, and it's the same as 1900. Uh, you still can be a black person and get shot, and uh, everyone wants to turn a blind eye. Yes, that's definitely an unfortunate fact of life right now. Uh, Suhana, your thoughts on this story? John, I wonder that with so much coverage that police brutality gets, that this act still go on and it almost makes me confused and uh, and scared at the same time that uh, despite how much protest people make, despite how much talk goes on in the community about people's safety and police showing more care at the job, such acts still have the audacity to happen. I I will not even waste my breath by addressing that how wrong it is because this is what we have been talking since 2019. And and let's not forget a whole last hundred years where people have been trying to make the situation better. But for some reason, I feel that all our political leaders and uh, the police departments, they just go away with a soft word saying that, this is terrible, we are really sorry, this should not have happened, we are taking investigating. But it's just because you're following a certain protocol doesn't make it easy. And I and I am confused and scared thinking that this is still a broad reality today, that 
if you're getting stopped by cop, you should feel for your life, whereas it should be otherwise. And this kind of discussion has been taken so many times for so long, but what makes me happy is that there was an immediate response from the public. People from the community came in together and they decided that this is not okay. And I feel more than the pain, it was the sheer frustration that how could you do this again? And uh, honestly, the, she might have shot a taser thinking, uh, she might have shot a gun thinking it was a taser, but that doesn't change the fact that you have done something so wrong in the middle of an environment like this. And it's almost mocking the people's sentiment who have been trying so hard to remove this kind of stigma from police department. And, you know, there's so many cops who are out there doing a good job, but then you make, you take such incidents take place and people are unsure again. And that officer doing such a thing in the middle of an environment which is trying, trying to be nurturing is a very big, uh, big joke on the face of the people who are fighting to make sure that this thing has not been happening again. I also oh. wonder that when we think about Dante Wright, how many of us think about Sam Sam DeBose and what mm. happened in his situation? And even though it, it, it was a University of Cincinnati police officer and it was a totally different scenario, it was still was a traffic stop with an expired plate. And I wonder how many people are thinking of that similarity to what happened to Dante Wright. Just something to throw out there. Yeah, and it's very sad too because he didn't even need to be tased in the first place either. So this just it seems like the whole system is just messed up. And I don't know what to say. I'm just I'm just dumbfounded. And some people don't even understand the severity of the issue. Black men are being like executed by the police, and I'm just so mad about it. This guy had like a one year old son, and now that son's gonna grow up without a father. He was 20 years old. It just it really infuriates me how these some of these cops think they're judge jury and executioner and they just don't even think about the consequences of firing that gun and like I don't know I'm just I'm just so flustered about this whole situation. Carter do you know if it was more than one shot or was it one shot? So far I've seen is just one gunshot but I don't know for sure. I just know that when I saw the video she was yelling taser 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 and you hear a gunshot and that's it. But then again, I have not looked at the video fully to see the, the full extent of what happened. I did take a, a quick look at the video. And yeah, I did see the part about the taser. And one thing that kind of aggravates me is that she's supposed, she's been on the force for 26 years, but she makes a simple mistake by that. Can't even tell the difference between a taser and a gun. I expect that to be a rookie mistake, but not from someone who's been on the police force for 26 years. That's really sad because that simple mistake just led to this young man's death. And it's just, it really makes me angry. I mean, the the, the play devil's advocate just a little bit. Um, to be a police officer, you, you act instinctively and you act on your training. Training is you grab, she grabbed her gun with her right hand. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume she's right-handed because it looked like her right hand she was shooting. I don't know for sure. But according to people, tasers usually on the left, your gun's on the right. Mm -hmm. So if she was going for her taser, she should have grabbed with her left. Right. But instead, she instinctively grabbed with her right and her gun. Right. So that is, you know, is that something that she has done in the past often where she's grabbed her gun and said taser and gotten away with it? Or again, or is they saying it was a mistake, it can happen, blah, blah, blah. And even the New York Times had an article today about citing 15 times a police officer has mistaken a gun for a taser because of where they draw. Again, it's it's a rush of adrenaline. You're acting instinctively. You have to make a split second decision. All that going into play, which will either play in, it's going to be a hard case to prosecute right. um, no matter what. So um, right. we'll just have to see what happens. And, you know, again, hope that it never happens again. Let's hope so. Uh, I like to be optimistic about that, but okay. So moving on to our second topic, a Windsor, Virginia police officer who pepper sprayed an army officer during a traffic stop last year has been fired 
the Windsor Police Department announced on Sunday. Joe Gutierrez was one of the two Windsor police officers caught on camera pointing their guns at Karan Nazario, a second lieutenant in the army, at a traffic stop at a gas station in December. In a body camera video shared online by the Associated Press, Gutierrez is also seen pepper spraying Nazario multiple times after one of the officers attempts to open his car door. Earlier this month, Nazario filed a lawsuit arguing that the officers violated his constitutional rights during a traffic stop in Windsor, located about 46 miles west of Virginia Beach. Andrea, your thoughts on this story? I think it's business as usual comes to mind in this case, but the fact that they didn't charge him, the fact that he had nothing done wrong, Again, a tra another traffic stop regarding a license plate seems to be the MO right now. The fact that it was, I think it's sort of disturbing, is a Latino person, I believe Gutierrez is a Latino, did this because there's so many issues going on. You would think an officer of color would be more cognizant and more practical in, ish in, in, in handling a traffic stop. You know, again, it's, it's something that could should not have escalated to what it was. And the guy did nothing wrong, even though he waited for um, to stop his car in a, in a lighted area instead of a dark area. You know, he feared for his life. He didn't know what he did wrong. There's a lot of what ifs involved in the situation, but the, unfortunately the officer did escalate the situation, which is again, split second decision. You either handle it correctly or you don't. Wade, uh, what are your thoughts on this story? Well, as our good friend on the radio would say, unbelievable. <laughs> uh, it, it's, all these things seem to follow the same thing. Uh, we have a uh, officer or police officers that seem to think that it's, it's uh, okay uh, to draw their guns for no reason. Um, it's, I, I, it brought to mind uh, they had a uh, video showing, I think it was last year, where the individual uh, police officer had him on his knees and was telling him to crawl toward him in a straight line. And if he moved this way or stumbled on all that, he actually told him he was going to shoot him just for making a mistake. Okay, he was unarmed. He's on his hands and knees. He was scared. He was uh, crying. Uh, telling the police officer he was scared and the officer was telling him that he would actually shoot him if he just made a simple mistake. And the guy, of course, terrified uh, as he's crawling and, and he falls and all that and everything, and the officer actually shoots him. So that's in the back of everybody's mind when uh, they're pulled over by a police officer. If you put your hands out the window, they'll shoot you. If you go for your the, the, to uh, unbuckle your seatbelt as they tell you, they'll shoot you saying that you're going for a gun. Uh, they were drawing orders to him so quickly, no matter what he did, he would be wrong. Uh, so it's very uh, scary, it's very frustrating, and I really uh, don't have an answer until cops start going to jail for their behavior. Uh, Suhana, what are your uh, thoughts on this topic? Um, John, I think police department should now stop playing God and save some grace for their other fellow officers, because this is almost embarrassing. This is embarrassing because uh, how, when did it become okay to take your gun out on every goddamn instance and uh, just for, you don't have a license plate, I'm going to pull my gun out on you. You don't have um, uh, some, your screens are dark, I'm going to pull a gun on you. And when gun doesn't work, I'll paper spray you. And I don't understand if this is a matter of color or if this is a matter of uh, ranking, but uh, I believe that irrespective of you, who you are, police has got this audacity that uh, they are, I think this is a kind of ego play where you feel that you're superior than the other person you're dealing with on the other side. And uh, this really takes away our opinion on compassion from the department uh, completely. I don't know why would you agree with the situation instead of following the protocol, but it seems like uh, in the country, we follow protocol only after a death. And uh, it's all protocol after the matter has been aggravated, but before that we were just acting on instincts. So 
it is uh, funny, it is shameful, and it is just sad that now even a veteran, uh, uh, I think the person is an active army personnel, uh, either way is getting affected by this. And this is not, not a good look. This is not good look. Uh, I don't know, is it, why does this kind of behavior resonate over and over the time? And uh, is it because people think that, uh, is it the rub off culture of the early 20s or maybe late 90s? But uh, the matter is not improving. Either somebody is getting shot or somebody is getting uh, uh, paper sprayed and the matter is not improving. I, it may sound completely wrong, but I have to address that. People have this opinion that the uh, low income African-American neighborhoods are unsafe and directly associate people of color into as somebody who, are, who would be unsafe for you. But it looks like we are in a time where people of color don't feel safe at all. And uh, I, it will be surprising if it's a revelation to someone today because it feels like you, the person who is surprised by this act is living under a rock. And um, I think it's beyond the high time that this kind of behavior must stop. But I think it may go on as long as we live, even if how much ever we protest or how much ever we may show our disconcern with it. Well, I, I think also what we need to point out is it's a matter of what the training is for the police officers regarding control. How are they taught to control a situation? How are they taught to control themselves? And how are they taught to react in a situation when someone does not do what they say? Um, does that amplify their emotions? Okay, we got to get this guy. He's not doing what we say. Or is it a power trip of, again, if the person is not reacting in a standard way, okay, boom, I have to pull my gun on you because you're not responding to what we know. I, I think a deeper dive is looking at what is the mental capacity of how they handle control and power over a person in that situation. And if it's gotten to the point of where they need to take a break, I mean, a lot of these officers that are committing these acts are people who have been in police officers for some time. And do they all need to take a little break, step away, reassess, and then come back? You know, that, that's just something to think about because all this comes down to power and control and who responds correctly or not. Well, I don't, I, I don't think it's a incidence of training. I have a brother that's a police officer, and uh, I think it's more of a incident of uh, no accountability. If police officers start, if police officers start going to jail for the uh, crimes they are committing, this would ease up very quickly. But for years, they know that they can hide, hide behind that blue wall and that uh, they'll be protected. Uh, no one will really go after them. Uh, and they'll get off, or they'll shoot a black man and then the judge will hug them, you know, that type of thing. So I think it's accountability that they know that they they have uh, been doing wrong for so many years and they've been protected. But they are not trained this way. Uh, they they have trained a lot better than this, but there's no accountability. That's true. That's all good points. Okay, so moving on to our next topic, which is about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Hamilton County Public Health tweeted in response to the extremely rare blood clotting events of six people after receiving the Johnson Johnson vaccine, the Ohio Department of Health is advising providers to temporarily pause using the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Hamilton County Public Health is following state guidelines and pause all distribution of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. At least 260,000 Ohioans have been vaccinated with the Johnson Johnson vaccine, far fewer than had received either competing vaccine when the state announced it would suspend use of the vaccine according to Governor Mike DeWine. However, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine had been central to Ohio's mass vaccination sites and campus vaccination programs, the latter of which had aimed to vaccinate many college students before the end of their spring semester. Most colleges will switch to a two-dose vaccine, DeWine said in a Tuesday afternoon news conference. The University of Cincinnati will begin distributing Pfizer doses 
but Miami University and some mass vaccination sites, including the one run out of Xavier University, Cintas Center in Cincinnati, will suspend the vaccination while the FDA and CDC reevaluate the vaccine. DeWine said the state has instructed providers that already received Johnson & Johnson doses to store them until further notice. Andrea, your thoughts on this um, topic? Well, I, I think it's one that's sad because I think so many people were depending upon getting Johnson & Johnson for it because it's one shot and you're done. You don't have to worry about a follow-up. But I think two, I go back to what happened in Europe where a similar vaccine created by AstraZeneca was put on hold because of blood clots as well. And then later on, it was deemed uh, appropriate because even though it was concerned, it was okay to use. And I think Johnson Johnson is going to have that same scenario happen to them. I think it comes down to because they were created differently from Pfizer and Moderna, you, you have a greater concern of this reaction. I'm, 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 I'm just perplexed about the whole thing. Wade, what are your thoughts? I'm not going to give too much on this. I'm just, I just wish that somebody would do a timeline going back to this time last year and coming forward with all the inconsistencies that we've been given about these vaccines and all this, this stuff. Uh, I just think if we look back at what we've been told, then what we were told again, and then the, the change that we was told the next time, and uh, it's, it's almost like, well, I'm, I'm gonna just hold off on this. I'll pass. Uh, Suhana, what are your thoughts? John, my dad said that anything is what sounds too ideal is too good to be true. <laughs> uh, when Johnson's and Johnson released their one shot vaccine, I was I had my apprehensions about I had my doubts on how well will the vaccine work. I find it quite hard to believe that only six people have been affected uh, and they have the reports so soon. I'm sure I, I believe there might be more cases eventually or have been which are not yet reported. But I hope like through the articles coming out, it will be easier for people who are affected to report this case. Moreover, I feel uh, Johnson's and Johnson should invest a little more using this particular time off shelf, uh, spend more time in uh, what's it, researching their vaccine so that uh, when once it's out, it is more um, more effective, but uh, until then, I feel it's uh, it's a very great thing that they have removed it off shelf and people are holding back on taking the vaccine. On another side, I feel that uh, the people in communities who have apprehension towards vaccine and uh, are hesitant to take it, this uh, particular news might aggra aggravate that feeling and people might be more resistant on taking vaccine. Here, on one side, we have achieved a good goal where we have informed people about the, the side effects of the vaccine and people are taking right amount of actions. But on a bigger picture, this news might uh, make people nervous about taking vaccines further because when I went to take my vaccine, uh, some the terms have been told to me that this is for emergency use and uh, you have to and you know you give your permission to get this vaccine and something on that line along that line so i i believe that this might generate a little um, nervousness among the community but uh, at the same time the government has taken the right decision of informing its people and at the same time keeping a hold on it but i believe it's still uh, isn't it like still available for vaccination or is it just state recommendation that uh, you know, you can choose to avoid taking Johnson and Johnson. Uh, well, what was that, John? Uh, um, well, according to Hamilton County um, Public Health Twitter account, they said it's been paused and the governor has paused the vaccine for Johnson and Johnson. So it, people, you know, you can't, you can't have it now. Well, I believe it's good business for Pfizer and uh, uh, the other vaccine that we are using. Uh, and at the same time, this might uh, bring very little effect because if I, uh, Johnson & Johnson is less than 5% of the vaccine in the market. So this might bring a very little effect to the Biden's uh, plan for vaccination. Uh, by I think by May, he has given a deadline. So it might have a little effect, but um, I'm glad that uh, the government has taken the right decision to give it a pause. True. But... Uh... I hope it doesn't have 
a long lasting effect because it's already hard to get people to take this vaccine. It's, you know, this whole COVID vaccine thing has been politicized and we didn't need any more setbacks. And now um, I hope it doesn't set it back too far. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to stay optimistic. All right. So moving on to our next topic is day 12 of the Derek Chauvin murder trial. What many folks feared finally happened on Tuesday as the defense began to put its witnesses on the stand. Through paid use of force expert Barry Broad, the defense found someone willing to say that Derek Chauvin's actions were justified. Broad said on the witness stand that though he has been paid over $10,000 by the defense for his testimony, he doesn't take one side over the other. However, his resistance and demeanor when questioned by the prosecution and the fact that he was the only use of force expert to take the stand and attempt to justify Chauvin's actions said otherwise. I felt Derek Chauvin was justified, said Broad, who added that Chauvin's conduct of pressing his knee into Floyd's neck for over nine minutes while he was handcuffed was reasonable and consistent with the Minneapolis Police Department procedures. Andrea, your thoughts on this topic? I'm surprised, but not surprised. Um, because the defense has, has, has a certain argument that they want to put present. And their argument has always been that Chauvin wasn't responsible for the death of George Floyd, that George Floyd was responsible for his own death because he took drugs. And they found people to testify to help support their argument. The fact that the expert said that he does not review department policy or regulations for each department that, that he, uh, you know, when he's asked to testify, sort of is like um, a detriment to his testimony. I mean, yes, he's a police, he's an expert on use of force. Yes, he can review the tape. The, but the fact of how he was able to say that Chauvin was not responsible for was surprising. And I think it took a lot of people by surprise. But at, at the same time, I think the prosecution did a very good job of deflecting what he said and turn it against the defense, turn his testimony against um, the, the defense's case. Right. Wade, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, it'll be interesting with the, the, the uh, emotions and everything out there today. It'll be interesting to see how the, uh, the uh, case turns out because again, it goes back to, to accountability and, and, police officers doing or uh, acting a certain way, knowing that they are protected. And again, this, this guy, he, uh, he doesn't really care what the policy is, but he's gonna say that the guy acted correctly, which is, 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 is you know, uh, I doubt if you can find anywhere in, in the police manual where they have a police officer uh, kneeling on somebody's neck. They have rules for the police officers. They have training and what they can and cannot do. And <laughs> for um, the guy to be a so-called so expert, again, it just shows that this is what has happened time and time again. Uh, and that's what has protected police officers in the past. So given the, the uh, emotional climate it is today, it would be very interesting to see what happens. Indeed. Suhana, your thoughts on this topic? John, you know, often people talk about if they had a time machine, they would go like to go back in certain period of time in their life or some the time, or they go to the future. I feel like I'm in this 21st century sitting on a time machine because the story is just same all the time. It's same. And I feel like I'm uh, still under 100 years ago uh, witnessing the similar things happening. Uh, in my opinion, Chauvin, uh, the gentleman who shot uh, George Floyd, oh, sorry, who led to the death of George Floyd, it is, will not win this case despite or whatever people are trying by getting um, someone who is an expert at police protocol. But um, the, uh, he might, he will definitely not win the case. And even if he gets off the case and, you know, he goes ahead to live his life, 
he will find very little peace because the public outrage is so heavy that uh, I, I don't think uh, anybody who spots him again in the force will keep the matters down. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the gentleman is ahead for a very sad life because this is going to haunt him for a very, very, very long time. But if this is a very different scenario, this is not a hundred years ago where he can get off with it. I'm pretty sure the justice department will definitely put him at the right prosecution. prosecution. And uh, I, I feel <laughs> the case dragging on so long. I, I don't understand what's, um, how department has not uh, gathered adequate evidence and enough reports by this time. Like it's almost like they're buying time to find enough evidence for the person who, who caused a murder. Uh, and they're just buying time so that, you know, we find at least one evidence to support his case and then we can close it off. Because under no normal circumstances with just one barely collected evidence, nobody wins a case. So I'm hoping that uh, this will have no effect in the future, uh, the, ju the justice for jo George Floyd. This should, this today's trial should not have any effect on this. But uh, if it by chance does, then oh my God, we are a hundred years behind and we, uh, we have a very, very, very long way to go before a black man can get his adequate justice. But I am not, I believe we are not hundred years behind. So, the right, uh, the right justice will be given, and the right decisions will be made. In my opinion, that's that's how I feel about the situation. Well, let's certainly hope so. And our last topic, and to end on a happy note, on April six, Tashara Jones became St. Louis's first Black woman mayor. Tashara Jones began her political career in 2002 as an appointed Democratic committee woman of St. Louis's 8th Ward. Most recently, Jones served two terms in the Missouri House of Representatives, becoming the state's first African-American and first woman to ascend to the assistant minority floor leader post. Andrea, your thoughts on this story? I think it's fabulous. Um, I, I think um, it's very difficult for a Black woman to get elected. So when it does happen, it's very empowering. And um, I, I think for St. Louis alone, it's a long time coming. She ran four years ago and didn't win, but I'm glad to see that it didn't stop her from trying again. And this time winning the day. I, I, I think it's fabulous and it's, it's empowering to women all over the place. Definitely. Wade, your thoughts? I think what we're seeing now is a, is a trend, a positive trend. Women in general, women of color in particular, uh, have decided that uh, we gave the, the men a chance. <laughs> We've sat back and we supported them and, and, and we said, go ahead, we, uh, do your thing and we're going to support you. And uh, after years of, and years of seeing people get in office and, and playing the same game, uh, women have decided it's time to step up and uh, take charge and, and uh, uh, get in these positions, these political positions where they can uh, uh, make change. And I think that we're going to see more of this. I think it's going to be more accepted. Uh, before, I mean, when I was young uh, and a woman was running, a lot of times other women would not vote for her. So she had a challenge not only against the men, but she had women that would, would not vote for her. But I think that has started to change now, and we're going to see more and more. Uh, uh, women take these offices, and I uh, uh, think we'll uh, we'll see in the next fifteen to twenty years how it goes. Yes, definitely. Suhana, your thoughts on this subject? Um, John, I think this year, uh, including the last year, has been a very empowering year for the women, and we have seen so many significant women coming in power this time. And now, what I now being, uh, what say? half glass empty perspective on it. I believe now it's time that women not get uh, too excited by being the first one in the room, but focus on doing the right thing and make sure that during their administration, they, live, uh, they leave a very strong uh, impression for themselves in a positive way. They benefit the community and do the right thing. And, uh, as, uh, and I feel 
I do believe and I wish that they take stands on matters that are important instead of just sending a press release and uh, giving um, generic statements. I, I, now that women are in office, I want them to take a more unique and stronger stand and not follow the same procedure their male counterpart followed. It's a, it's a hopeful wish that we see a new air in the in, in the political environment with women coming more more women coming in power, but at the same time it's a good thing that after so much so many terrible things happening, we can take a moment to rejoice and celebrate the fact that no more women are not feeling alone when they are standing up pursuing a career because now they finally see themselves getting reflected, and. Um, uh, in Mulan, there's a song in Mulan which says, uh, which talks about when will my reflection show who I am inside. And I think we are in a time now where many girls would agree that they can finally see their reflection and uh, see themselves more clearly, understand themselves more clearly. So a great day today ending on a fantastic note and it's a moment to celebrate. I'm very happy. Definitely. Um, well, everyone, that was a very fascinating discussion today. I want to thank everyone for coming on today. That was a really, really great talk. And um, make sure to tune in to next week's show to hear more about owning it. We talked about it last week. And if you don't remember, owning it is a free home ownership webinar. And make sure to register for the actual owning event, which will be on Saturday April the 24th from noon to 1.30. The event, like I said, it's free. It's hosted by Roy Sutton. He was the senior vice president at Fifth Third Bank. If you want to know how to build generational wealth, just uh, make sure you register for it. Search Owning It 2021 on Eventbrite. And you can also find the link on all of our social media channels. If you like the news topics we discussed today, make sure to read the stories on our website at the www.thecincinnatiherald.com and make sure to check out our print edition, which is also sold at your local Kroger, UDF, Walgreens, Joseph Beth Booksellers, and at select service stations. Make sure to follow us at the Cincinnati Herald on Facebook. Make sure to follow us at Cincy Herald on Twitter and Instagram. Follow us on YouTube at the Herald TV. And you can also follow us on our TikTok channel. Just search the Cincinnati Herald. And make sure to get vaccinated because in the state of Ohio, anyone over the age of 16 is now eligible to get a vaccination shot. I'm John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald and have a good day.